Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this um, presentation of transportation and shipping container validation best practices. A uh, few quick things before we start. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation today. If you have questions you would like our panel to answer, you can submit them in the question box on the control panel on the right side of your screen. In that same control panel, you'll also see a handout section toward the bottom where there is a PDF of our presentation today that you can download. This webinar is being recorded, including the question and answer session, and the recording will be sent to everyone within 24 hours, generally, of the um, presentation. So if you miss any of it, you can always go back and, and listen to that after the fact. All right, um, I would like to hand it over to Rob Briggs to start our webinar today. Rob, it's all you. Thank you, Amy. So as Amy just mentioned, my name is Rob Briggs. I am a validation business development manager for Massey Bioservices. Been with Massey for just about four years, and I've been in the uh, pharmaceutical life science industry now for 20 plus years. Juan? Thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. My name is Tuan Nguyen, and I'm the validation manager for Massey's California branch. I've been with Massey for the last three years and have six years of experience in laboratory operations, quality control, quality assurance, and validation. I'm passing on to Alex now. Hi, I'm Alex Tiversini. I'm a validation engineer at Massey. I've been with Massey for three years, and I have uh, three years of experience in the field. Pass it over to John. Hello, everyone. My name is John Orange. I come to you today with over a decade of experience in the validation field. Uh, I've been with um, Massey for over six years now, and I'm the director of biorepository operations. Thanks. Back to you, Rob. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, so as an introduction here for today, uh, we'd like to talk to you about transportation validation and shipping container validation. Primarily, we're going to be talking about mapping, thermal mapping, because that's what Massey does, the thermal mapping piece of it. We do work with others to do the shock and the drop tests, uh, but primarily today we'll be focused on thermal validation. And uh, as part of that, we talk about cold chain. So cold chain, as defined by Wiki, is a temperature controlled supply chain. And it's basically an unbroken chain. So if you look at this here, where we have holding and distribution, that's listed out the holding part is the warehousing, it's the CTUs or controlled temperature chambers. Some people call those temperature control chambers to TCUs. But those type of chambers are your refrigerators, your freezers, your cold rooms. And then if you get into distribution, you're talking more about planes, trains, automobiles, great movie by the way. And uh, you get into transporters and shipping containers. So with that said, just as a very large picture, we take a look at this holistically. What you have is you have the manufacturing piece up here, you have warehousing here, build finish, distribution, and then you have the clinic of the hospitals. So I know there's been a lot of articles that have been out there around uh, cold chain, especially with the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And if you think about it, a lot of the, the things that we have here when we're moving from one, one place to another, because typically most of these things aren't all together, um, you need transportation containers. You need to have a transport system such as a truck or a trailer to be able to move those, those necessary goods and products from one place to another. And when you're doing that, you want to make sure that it's validated because you want to make sure it's doing what's purporting to do, that it's actually holding temperature, that that critical product is going to be safe and it's going to remain, uh, have its efficacy and its potency when it, when it comes to the clinic. So that way those who are taking it get the right thing, get the right drug, and it's not degraded. All right, I think we are up to, and before we get into the meat and potatoes, we have some poll questions. So this is, I think, is the first one. So Amy, could you hit us with the first poll question, please? I do have a poll. Um, the first poll question you'll see on your screen, which aspects of cold chain temperature mapping are you most familiar with? Um, vehicles, shipping containers, both or neither? I'll give you, um, you guys a, a minute to, take a minute to answer this. And give a couple more minutes that people are still thinking about it. All right. Um, I'm going to close the poll and we'll see the results. Which aspects 
um, of cold chain temperature mapping are you most familiar with? It looks like most people said both, but there were almost the same amount of people who said vehicles is primarily what they were most familiar with. Okay, great. So I'll give that back to you, Rob. Thank you, Amy. All right, so moving on, um, what we've done in the past, and, and we, we structured this webinar very similar to the one that we did for warehouses and the one that we did for autoclaves. We're gonna chunk uh, a lot of the pieces into four, four separate pieces, creating a plan, executing a plan, analyzing results, and then giving conclusions and recommendations at the end. So let's start that off now, and we'll start with uh, the trucks and trailers and some things to consider with the trucks and trailers uh, are the area, so the storage envelope, uh, temperature specs of the product that you're looking to store, uh, also the transport solution, whether it's a truck or whether it's a, some other sort of vehicle, a van, and then shipping duration. Besides for those, Tuan, what else do we look for? Thanks, Ralph. The first and the most critical thing we look for is the user requirement specification, which in the real life setting, it's like having a journal or agenda on what you want to do. In the requirement specification, you look for creating specifications for your design specification, installation qualification, operational qualification, and your performance qualification. A major thing we look for in the design specifications on the truck and trailer is when we consider the volume and sto of storage envelope, temperature specs, and transportation needs, especially with COVID this year. It's important that the truck or trailer completely stays within its temperature specs uniformly. With potential vaccines being transported all over the world at numerous different environmental temperature ranges, it's important to have the correct designs to prevent drugs and vaccines for consumer treatment getting compromised. Features of the design that are crucial include proper insulation, the trucks having the right air movement with bat holes in the truck, the door design, and how the truck door opens up in the loading dock. These are all especially important as if the truck isn't designed properly, the truck will not be able to uniformly sustain its operating range in harsher weather conditions. Other notable items we look for is humidity specifications. If the product, potential product has a specific humidity range, air intake and exhaust, uh, lights, and the product storage type. I'm going to give it back to Rob for the regulation standards and guidances. Okay, yeah, so when you're creating your plan, uh, or your protocol, you definitely, I mean, you might have a, a validation master plan, something that's overarching, um, but if you don't and you're really looking into things for the very first time, there's a lot of guidance and a lot of different things that are out there. If, if you look at like uh, 21 CFR 211, it goes into holding and distribution, but it doesn't give you a whole lot of distribution. That's why you see a lot of uh, different standards and guidance out there, such as some of the ones that are listed here, like the PDA, uh, Report 39, which is a cold chain guidance document, uh, USP 36, and then USP uh, 659, which is the package and storage requirements. That actually is a really good document. It gives you a lot of definitions uh, into what low temperature storage is considered, and then you know what refrigerated, uh, what's refrigerated, what's uh, normal room temperature. So those type of things, those are always always really good to be able to tie into your protocol be able to say where you're getting a lot of this uh, type of criteria that you might be setting up uh, for your protocol. All right, Alex, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about study length and conditions? Uh, so what durations provide the best mapping? Uh, what conditions should be studied? Sure, thanks, Rob. So uh, think of a truck or a trailer as a cold room on wheels. So we want to test uh, each compressor system that's in the truck for 24 hours. Um, we also want to uh, Look, check for uh, weather conditions, right? So, um, are we shipping to somewhere, you know, in the summer where it's hot or in the winter where it's cold? We want to do mappings to uh, capture both. So, we want to capture a summer mapping, we want to do a winter mapping because uh, outdoor conditions are going to have a great effect on how your compressor runs and how uh, temperatures maintain. We also want to look at for uh, PQ testing, uh, worst case shipping routes. Uh, we want to take into account, um, hey, maybe we're shipping uh, our product to the middle of the desert in the middle of the summer where temperatures get you know, up and above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, we want to consider um, you know, worst case travel locations and how they will affect our assets uh, or product. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So very similar again, uh, turning turning attention more now to shipping containers. 
Uh, there are some similarities between the, the trucks and con the containers and some of the things that we look at. I know Twana mentioned URS, uh, designer experiments, DOE. John, what are some other considerations we give when we're, when we're assessing the storage envelope for shipping containers? So storage envelopes, actually one of, one of the most important parts of designing or, or looking into the requirements for your shipping container. Uh, take, for example, uh, off-the-shelf situations where you might purchase a liquid nitrogen doer. Uh, you really don't have much of a choice. Uh, you're, you're purchasing something that has a predetermined amount of space. Um, maybe five cryo boxes can go inside, something like that. But when, when you're looking at designing a shipping container, uh, you kind of have to pay particular attention to, it's a ratio. It is, it is a, the difference between, it's the um, ratio of payload area to the temperature controlled material that's insulating the inside of your, um, inside of your uh, shipping container. So you, um, you, you don't want a minimal amount of dry ice, let's just say, or refrigerated gel packs. You want to be able to sustain uh, the amount of um, uh, the, the duration of time during your transportation. So um, I, I'd pay particular attention to, uh, attention to that. Thanks. Okay, great. All right, so again, on um, regulation standards, some, some guidance as well. So some of the same ones that we follow for, for the shipping. We have PDA Tech Report uh, 39, USP 36 that's out there. Uh, if you get into more like the air uh, air transport, so that's the International Air uh, Transport Association, IATA, uh, there's temperature control regulations there. Um, I know there's certification that goes along with that as well. Uh, I think we have some guys that train on it at Massey uh, just for what we do. There's also ASTM uh, 4169, and that is more of a physical testing standard. Uh, for, for shippers. And then there's also guidance and certification if you get into ISTA, which is the uh, International Safe Transit uh, Association. Uh, and that has a lot of the different things like shock, vibration, compression, um, some of the same things you'll find inside of ASTM 4169, but they also go a little bit further. They do have uh, some profiles, which uh, 7E is, is your temperature profiles that they have both for winter and for summer. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. And then they also have what's called a standard 20, which is a certification uh, that's out there. So you have to, if you want to get ISTA 70 certified, you have to use the standard 20 to be able to do so. All right, so if we're starting to talk a little bit more about qualifications, let's talk about typical qualifications for shipping containers. Twine, can you take that away? Yes, I can, Rob. Thank you for that. Uh, similar to trucks and trailers, Shipping containers contain the same typical qualification tips, which include design, operational, and performance qualifications. There are some instances where an installation qualification is conducted as well, but that is normally only specific to trucks and trailers and their design. Um, John, can you get more specific into the study length? Yeah, um, study length is something that you could look at um, a number of different you can look at a number of different places to determine what your study length should be uh, for a shipping container. So I, I like ISTA. ISTA has some really good material out there. Um, ISTA 7E 2010 is the, the guideline. They have uh, great information. Uh, if you're looking for guidance, if you haven't done this before, or you're looking to test your um, shipping containers to meet a certain, they actually have certifications you can get. You can you can actually get ISTA certified uh, shipping containers. So a lot of good content there. But but in that in that guideline they mention challenging a 72 or 144 hour profile. But they also leave uh, they they kind of leave it like it's a recommendation for consideration. So just like you would a a truck or a vehicle or a reefer truck, however you're going to uh, classify them, look at what your actual application is. So if you know that you're going across country and if you know that you might be um, looking at about a week in, trans in transportation, maybe you need the challenge a week. Um, in most cases, if you're just doing you know, overnight packaging or something, maybe the 72 hours is appropriate. So I think a lot of it depends on your application. Thanks. Okay, so Alex, can you talk to us a little bit about conditions? Uh, yes, thanks, Rob. Um, so, 
condition, we want to test a, a multitude of conditions, right? We want to capture our worst case condition, which would be a uh, minimum load. That could be something as an empty vessel, uh, or it could be something with just like a, one vial in this vessel. Um, we also want to test maximum loads. Uh, what, you know, what this uh, shipping container, this uh, truck will be like uh, with a uh, full product in um, or representative product. Um, we want to test in triplicate for B, for each OQ and PQ. Um, this gives us repeatability and it gives us uh, really, really um, a good sense of how the whole times are going to be, uh, how, how the whole times are going to be done in a, a real life scenario. Uh, we also want to take into account uh, shock and vibration testing. This is going to, you know, test uh, how uh, the container will respond to real life conditions, like uh, this shipping container sitting in the back of a truck on the highway moving fast, it's gonna shake around, it may even fall over. We wanna make sure this, this uh, shipping container can maintain the product at a temperature, even in these uh, you know, outside situations. Um, and this can be done in OQ, this can be done in PQ as well. Back to you, Rob. I guess I have to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> one question for you, Alex. So on on the triplicate, you, you would recommend doing that seasonally? Yes, yeah, yeah, seasonally. So uh, as I had said before, um, you know, trucks and trailers will be uh, definitely variable um, in winter or summer months. So um, doing, you know, testing uh, for winter and summer is uh, definitely recommended. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Last, last part about creating a plan, uh, and I'm gonna keep you on the hook, Alex. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit around like product and some special considerations that you might wanna take inside your protocol when you're creating your plan? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you want to mimic the product as best as you can. Now, using an actual product you're gonna ship out during the testing phase uh, could be expensive and losing the product could not be very, you know, would not be very good. So we want you to get as close to as possible to the product in your ship. So something is vials with a, a buffer like glycol that represent, you know, the actual vaccine or, or something of that nature to kind of uh, represent the product without, um, you know, putting a lot of money investment into it. Um, next, I'll uh, pass it over to John to talk about preconditioning. Thanks, Alex. Um, you know, preconditioning, um, it, it could, um, you could have a number of different factors. It depends on the temperature controlled material. Liquid nitrogen tanks, for example, or dewers, they might require a, a overnight fill uh, precondition with liquid nitrogen, uh, or you can maybe uh, expedite that process by executing what they consider to be a quick fill, a quick charge. Uh, you might have also uh, other types of material that you need to use to um, put into your containers like refrigerated gel packs or frozen gel packs. Um, again, it all, de it all depends on how you um, designed your shipping container and the steps you're going to take to control your temperature. Um, that, that's that ratio I was uh, referring to earlier of uh, temperature control material to payload area. So, thanks. Okay, I'm going to keep you on the hook too here, John, for a moment. So uh, around best practices related to temperature loggers, and so those loggers that are doing the constant monitoring of the product, especially after you get the validation piece done, can you speak a little bit about the, the creation of the plan to make sure that you're, you're getting the correct loggers? Yeah, so temperature loggers are actually um, one of the most, if not the most critical part of, of this process. It's ultimately going to be your end of day GMP record uh, during transportation. And after validation is done and gone, they've done their job, you have a nice passing validation report, it looks really nice. What you wanna be able to do is demonstrate repeatability. And, uh, and, and once you have no more validation sensors inside of that, that vessel, uh, you wanna make sure that your monitoring device is doing its job. Uh, a calibrated, NIST traceable, calibrated device um, placed either inside of your shipping container. Sometimes the application might be a little bit uh, harsh for, for that logger to be submerged in that environment, like an LN2 vessel, where an LN2 vessel, in most cases, you have an external uh, sensor that's 
penetrated into your payload area. So pay particular attention during the validation to do a comparison between your data and your monitoring sensor so that you can rely on that device after validation pulls out. Rob? All right, great. I think we are up to our poll question number two. So Amy, I'll kick it over to you for a moment. Okay. Our next poll will come up on your screen. It, what material do you typically use to control temperature in shipping containers? And the options are liquid nitrogen, dry ice, cold packs, or other. I'll leave this up for a minute for people to answer. All right, it looks like most people have answered. Um, I'm going to close the poll. And it looks like the results are dry ice for the win. So most people, 54% said dry ice was what they typically use. And second would be cold packs, liquid nitrogen third, and no one chose other. <laughs> so those are our results. I don't think there's any wrong answer there. It all depends on what you're shipping around. Uh, but no, that's good. That's good. Thank you, folks. Uh, all right. So we have talked about creating a plan. Let's start talking about executing a plan. So Tuan, I know we're, we're looking here on the on the right side of the screen uh, about some, some trailers. So can you give us a lowdown on executing a plan for trailers? Yes. Thanks, Rob. Once all the requirements and regulations, guidances, and standards are all determined, and we have the design we desire for our truck, we move on to the next phase, which is executing the plan. Um, during this step, we want to determine our sensor layout diagram for a truck or trailer based on the potential worst case scenarios and locations. Um, this may vary based on the size of the truck, but you want to be sure you have the sensors in the worst case locations so you can determine the hottest spots and the coldest spots where you'll need monitoring sensors after the study is completed. Uh, looking at the picture to the right, this is a simulated sensor layout diagram that was actually used for a real live time mapping study. 27 cents were, were specifically used to show all areas that may impact product or be impacted by the environmental conditions. Looking at the labels on here, it's imperative that the sensors are labeled beforehand in case specific areas need to be looked at for temperature control adjustments while chamber stabilization and equilibration are in progress. When comparing real-time uh, loggers and traditional loggers, whether you use either, it's important to ensure that the loggers are within its NIST traceable calibrated timeline prior to the stu study being conducted at its proper usage range. So if you're using it for 2 to 8, you maybe want to have it calibrated within a range of 0 to 10. If you're using it for 15 to 30, you want to make sure that you have a bracketed range so that the sensors you're using are accurate enough. It's also important to have sensors where you can readily look at the data at any time, whether it's on a laptop with the data logger software, or it's on a cloud-based website where you can check the data from anywhere. Um, when seeing live data, any temperature controlled judgments need to be made prior to the start of the study. This is the reason why an outside temperature logger is important, as it will provide you a direct trend on how much impact the direct heat or coldness affects the sensors inside the trailer or truck throughout the day. Uh, we now look into the next point, which is sensor disruption. Once we have our sensor layout diagram for our truck and we know what sensors we want to use, we want to now figure out how to fix our sensors so that, it, so that there is no disruption during our studies, as this, can may, as this may have a major effect in terms of timeline if there are disruptions. Um, if the insulated walls inside the trailer truck are magnetic, then great, you'll be able to use magnets. But if not, you'll want to determine and plan out whether you want to use tape or stronger adhesive to place your sensors. Um, another alternative may be if you want to use telescopic poles where you can string your sensors to. Uh, reiterating with my statement from earlier, um, it's important to mark your sensors as it's a risk mitigation tool as if any sensors are disrupted, you'll know what sensor it is and where it is located so that you can act on it. Um, during the study, having real-time data is key. Having real-time data may potentially save you a lot of time, especially if you're in the performance verification or qualification phase where studies may last a couple of days on the road. Having real-time data provide you with the potential trends that are necessary in seeing if changes may need to be made 
prior to a study being conducted, especially in harsher weather conditions. From experience during an actual mapping study I performed, I actually had a sensor moved from its original location, and I found out when it was moved based on the live data trends. Experiences like this make verifying the post-study sensor placements extremely significant, so your studies are not compromised. I'm going to bring it back to Rob now. Okay, actually one question for you, Tuan. Uh, talk a little bit about the sensors and the accuracy, so the different sensors that we would use for a mapping like this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so depending on what you get your sensors calibrated to, you want to make sure that you have the bracket range like we stated earlier. So if we want to have it used for a two to eight range, you want to make sure that you have a zero to 10 range to withstand any, any issues that may occur when you perform your mapping study. All right, let's go to, uh, let's, let's take a look at it from the, the standpoint of a shipper. Uh, so some of the same stuff does apply again that was over with the with the uh, trailer but uh, with the shipper itself here alex um sense account and leo can you give us a little bit of an update on on that and uh, basically what you would do there yeah sure rob so um for a shipping container we want to challenge the top middle and bottom plane of the uh payload here so these depending on what side you're doing are you doing minimum load or are you doing maximum load um, these sensors could be just on the rack that's placed in there, or these sensors could be in the box that's placed in the rack. Uh, sensors could be penetrated in vials if you choose to. Uh, we also want a, another sensor next to whatever monitoring sensor you have, be it you know, a temp tail or something of that nature. We also want a external um, sensor, and I'll pass that over to John to talk more about that. Thanks, Alex. So if, if you look at the diagram that we have up on the screen, you'll notice you have an inside payload area, which are your cryo uh, boxes, and you have those cryo boxes situated in a shipping container. And that shipping container is also in, a, in an outside package uh, casing, um, and, and that's really to help it from tipping over or something and protects it during transport. It's it's a great idea, and it's actually pretty standard standard practice to place an external sensor on the outside of that case somewhere so that you can see what impact your uh, ambient temperatures are having on that shipping container. If you place your shipping container inside of a ramping chamber to simulate a night-day uh, hot cycle or a cold cycle, something like that, you could roll out any kind of um, impacts that the outside environment had on your study. So it's it's definitely a critical sensor. In most cases, reference purposes only. So I don't really see any uh, acceptance criteria tied to this sensor. It's really just used as a very good reference. So thanks, Rob. Hey, great, thank you. All right, so we've talked about creating a plan. Uh, we've executed it. Now let's get into analyzing some of the results. So Tuan, if we're analyzing results for a tractor trailer truck or or some sort of van, how do we go about it? Thanks, Rob. Once execution has begun and all the sensors are fixed to the trailer truck, we move on to this next stage of the process of analyzing the data results and acceptance criteria. Uh, before running the mapping study on the truck, you want to ensure that your sensors are given ample time to stabilize. Whether a static, dynamic, empty, or loaded approach is used, verifying repeatability through the data and graph through cycles or flat graph trends are important in verifying consistency of your truck. Uh, the diagram on the right here captures a simulated sensor layout diagram for any of the mapping configurations. Using this approach, the streams of this trailer truck are accounted for in regards to hot and cold spots. In, the, in this case, these cold and hot spots were reserved based on a static mapping configuration. When examining the mapping results, the effects of the season you are mapping in can have a drastic effect on what your data looks like and if it will be able to meet a stringent operating range. Um, looking at our truck on the right here, the warmer spots on the truck were analyzed to be the least insulated locations on the truck on bottom. The reason behind this is that, especially during the more extreme seasonal temps, hot or cold, having the truck stagnant where direct sunlight can drastically affect specific areas of the truck will cause these extreme areas to be hotter or colder based on their environmental temperatures. Uh, the coldest spot of the trucks were on the more upper regions of the inside of the truck, as of the result of the airflow circling from the top to the bottom of the truck. Um, when looking at the hottest and coldest spots on the truck during the study, 
you want to be sure that the extremes on the locations you see meet the acceptance criteria, whether it's two to eight, like we talked about earlier, or 15 to 30, et cetera. You want to be especially sure that the centers can withhold the acceptance criteria during the worst conditions of the day based on the sensors you have outside that can help you see the trends. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, Tuan. All right, let's see, and I'll have some other results then for a shipping container. So on this one, Alex, would you uh, would you go over the uh, simulating and analyzing of the thermal profile? Sure thing, Rob. So um, we have two graphs here on the right. Uh, the bottom one is actually the external sensor John was talking about. So for this study, we had a shipping container placed in a ramping chamber to uh, simulate uh, the day-night cycle of an extreme summer temperature. So the cycle will go from 25C up into 40C, um, which is a pretty extreme summer day. Uh, so the, the top graph here is how our sensors in the shipping container responds to that. So you see here, we have a bar for minus 135C. That is our acceptance criteria for um, hold time, our hold temperature. So as soon as the temperature sensors go past that 35 minus 135C, you can have your hold time here. So as we see, as it starts, all the temperatures uh, of the sensors in the container are uh, right around LN2 temps. Um, and as the study goes on, more LN2 is gonna be evaporating from that shipping container. You start to see temperatures climb and climb and climb until they reach that minus 135 uh, bar. And where the sensors reach that minus 135 bar is where you get your hold time of your shipping container. Uh, I'll pass it on to John to talk about uh, product monitoring. Again, uh, thanks, Alex. Again, uh, the monitoring sensor is going to be what gives you that layer of confidence uh, that your product is safe when you no longer have validation in the shipping container. So uh, making that comparison of, of how accurate your monitoring probe is during the validation process, it's imperative. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it to where uh, you didn't make that comparison, and all of a sudden, months later, you think there's a problem. And you say, you know, did something change? Is is there a problem? Do I now need to look into repair and, and change control and revalidate? Um, so it's like one of those, uh, you know, an, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure type of things, um, where you put the work in up front to establish uh, that comparison, and, and you have the confidence that you're reading accurately downstream. So, um, you know, yeah, L looking at the, the duration of time and, and the failure rate, if you do have a failure, now, now if your validation study passes, um, then you really need to consider, um, you know, that, that accuracy, but if it fails, so I think the next bullet point on here is, what if a study fails? So again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, if you put that work in upfront, thinking about your acceptance criteria. How long do I really need this shipping container for? That's your application should help define, really define what your acceptance criteria is. I'll give you an example, if, if you go into this and you think that um, I'm gonna just test this based on 14 days because you know that, that's what the manufacturer said it can do. Well, if that's what your true acceptance criteria is, great. But now, if you get to day 11, day 12, day 13, and, and you fail, now you have to consider, you know, can I use that container, or did I really need it for three days? Maybe I should have tested it for three days. It's harder to defend. It doesn't look good at all uh, when you have the acceptance criteria built. You don't, you don't pass, and then all of a sudden, you make an excuse as to why it's okay. So put the thought into it up front and figure out what that criteria is. Um, because if you don't if you don't pass, you can't use it. Thanks, Rob. All right. All right, great. Thanks, John. All right, Amy, poll number three. Okay, our third poll will be up on your screen right now. What type of data collection system do you use for temperature mapping? So the options are a wireless data logger with real-time data collection, wireless data logger without real-time data collection thermocouples and a validator, or I'm not sure, or have not performed a mapping before. So we have a minute for people to answer. Okay, 
looks like everyone has voted. I'm going to close the poll and share the results with you guys. And it looks like most people have used a wireless data logger with real-time data collection, second being thermocouples and a validator. Um, wireless data loggers without real-time data collection, it was 11%. So I'm back to you, Rob. Excellent. Great to know. Uh, it's always interesting to see how others do uh, do validation. Uh, I've been part of a few different validation teams over the years, and uh, each spot, you know, we certainly follow the regulations, the rules that are out there, create our protocols and stuff like that, but every place uh, just a little bit different as to, to what we chose for the, the tools of the trade to be able to get the job done. All right, so let's move on to uh, conclusions. Uh, and on here, uh, what we'll do is, uh, Johnny O, uh, I know you just talked about results, especially failing results. Uh, what about uh, those results that are the other way, that, that pass, and, and how do we make use of those? Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I think looking at this, it's it's much different. Um, when When you're designing something like this, you want to put in the effort up front to define what your process is and and try not to make it so complicated that operations can't really repeat it. And, and when you think of the essence of validation and, and really what it's intended to provide, it's repeatability. So not only during the validation studies and the requals, but when you're in operations, when your actual product is inside of the vessel, uh, repeating th that same mode of operation. So uh, how you can do that is to uh, uh, prepare some kind of a job aid or a procedure or a work instruction uh, as you're going throughout the validation process. So those could be things like uh, stabilization time required for uh, the use of the refrigerated truck, uh, maybe operating defrost cycles or how you're going to use the vehicle. For shipping containers, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the focus is put on the pack out procedure. Because really, there's no mechanical elements to it. I mean, it really isn't many, if if any. But it's it's all in the preparation of that vessel, and you want to make sure that it's prepared the same time every time. So I think my my key piece of advice here would be not to create it so complicated that it can't be repeated or it has a very low chance of being repeated. Thanks. Okay, Twine, can you speak about uh, requalification when that's needed? Yep, Rob. Um... When we look at requalification of the transportation and storage containers, we base it on a couple aspects on when it is needed. First, we look at preventive maintenance. Is there's procedures in place where we need to know when we need to perform PMs to keep the truck containers in a good condition. Um, secondly, we look at procedures that we have in place. Do we have a procedure we have in place or SOP where it states that we need to do requalification for one year, two years, or five years? Uh, you then also want to look at other things that may occur, whether if there's a critical or process change that happens. If there's a critical or process change that happens that may affect the performance of the truck or the storage contain containers, that also may spark a requalification earlier than expected. Um, the last thing we look at, which Alex will elaborate on in a little bit, we look at the modern devices to see if there are any shifts and changes in the trend to jumpstart a requalification being needed. And I'll pass it on to Alex now to elaborate on monitoring and ensuring product quality. Yeah, uh, monitoring is critical, as Swan said, because uh... It really gives you a sense of uh, when you need to recall, if there's an issue or um, what's going on uh, when you don't have uh, validation sensors in. So there's a, you can consider your, from the results of your studies, uh, your worst case locations. Um, this is generally where you'd want to monitor your, your temperature the most. Um, and that can be in air or it can be, that monitoring sensor can be penetrated um, in a, uh, representative product as I uh, kind of said earlier because uh, maybe you don't care as much about what the air temperature of this truck is in this single spot. You care about uh, what it's doing to your actual product. So sometimes a penetration sensor is uh, gives you more information on what's actually happening to your uh, money maker. All right and uh, I'll pass it off to Rob. All right thanks. Uh, before we close with, uh, with audience questions, I was just wondering, is there is there any pitfalls or anything else that you guys want to talk about? I don't know if you guys had an additional story. I know it's fine. You talked about a story of missing one of the one of the probes. Do we have one at all around like a MB or a shipping container that you guys had? Um, yeah, I'll I'll go. Um, I, I think one of the the key points that I brought up earlier about choosing the right acceptance criteria. 
it actually happened. Um, you know, I've seen it before. Um, and and you have you have a situation where where you're arbitrarily picking what the uh, the duration of time is. So it, it was good that we kind of looked and took a step back and said, what what is the actual uh, the individual we were working with? You know, what what is the actual acceptance criteria? Had we wouldn't have done that, we would have been in that very situation that I described, where you have a failed study because it, it didn't map for the the duration of time based on you know what what the manufacturer said that the vessel could do. It's why you test it. You don't just take their word for it. You got to prove it. But you know, when you look at the actual application, it's well, okay, if we're shipping to um, you know, the other side of the nation and you're going through the desert, now you're looking at the hot uh temperature profile. Um, you know, maybe maybe you don't care so much about the cold profile, but maybe we need seven days and you know, a lot of good uh, good information. So you have your uh duration of time that that you uh your acceptance criteria. Uh, defines, but you might also want to run it to until failure. Uh, now that information could just be kind of kept in your back pocket for reference purposes. So you know, well, uh, it's it's validated for seven days, um, but just to know that you have confidence that you know maybe maybe it actually mapped out for ten days. It's just good to know. Um, those are some real life examples of something that you know a hiccup that I've encountered uh, in my time. Right. Okay, Amy, we're up to audience questions. Do you got any for us? I do have a few questions. Um, I'll read the questions and then Rob, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Um, the first question I have is, are there any differences between qualifying a standard box truck versus a 53 foot trailer? Twan, uh, Twan, mind taking that one? Yep, yeah. yeah, I can take that one. Uh, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Rob. Um, typically a box truck is smaller, uh, 53 inch trailer or our trailer our truck is usually 53 inches and usually needs a thermal sock to distribute the air flow across the length of the physical uh, physical payload area whereas the box truck is a lot smaller so the air mixing is uh, is more fine so in terms of the physical or the more mapping aspects of that that's the biggest difference um, the other difference you can say is that the bo box truck has a detached um, uh, I guess a uh, it has a de detached storage area, whereas the, the 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 trailer doesn't have a detached area. So you have those two different aspects on there. Yeah, if I could, if I could just uh, also piggyback off what Tuan's saying about the thermal sock, I think it's pretty important to to just quickly elaborate on that. The thermal sock is the, um, it, it is like a um, sheet of plastic or some kind of material that runs along. The, the top spine of the uh, storage area. And that's because the, the air blowing from the fan banks, so it doesn't diffuse immediately towards the front of that vessel. It actually has a channel to flow through uh, all the way towards the back of the truck and then circle around so that you have air actual air circulation. Um, box trucks might just, they, they might just diffuse, it might be such a small area that the diffusal of that temperature really is it doesn't need that channel to flow through thanks uh great i have another question um from the audience any thoughts insight regarding air and sea shipment air and sea sorry yes yes <laughs> ocean sea so we we've talked about the the uh IATA that's out there so there is a certification for that so when it when it comes to that I, I rely on what's inside that for for your air uh, for C I haven't worked on anything that's uh, for the C has anyone else here um, yeah you know what sometimes actually I'm, I'm kind of in a um, unique situation now because I get to see a lot of different shipping containers and uh, you know, I know that some of the examples we use, it's it's actually very clear cut. Um, you know, either a heavy duty plastic thermally insulated somehow, or styrofoam boxes with dry ice. Uh, th those are some of the simple um, the simple shipping containers. When you look at something a lot more complicated, uh, you know, they have like these um, big environmentally controlled contain uh, containers that are 
you know, I don't know, you have maybe a dozen or so batteries in there that operate a little fan that you fill up dry ice in and uh, you could maybe load a pallet of material into. Uh, it's actually, um, they're, they're actually pretty big. And, uh, and I believe that they, they use them in both the airlines and, the, uh, and for, for shipments. But it, it all comes back to that uh, duration of time. How long is it going to take to ship your material across, uh, across the ocean? So I hear a lot of buzz in the industry about the, the last mile, you know, and, and you have the manufacturing uh, manufacturing operations that, you know, take the material and, and we treat it so good during the process, you know, and we, we treat it like, it, and, and so it's, you go through and we qualify our chambers and we look at all the redundancies. When you get to the shipment, there's a lot of eyes on it now. So as long as you can ship the containers, and they could withstand the uh, the shock and vibration, which is also mentioned in the uh, ISTA 70 2010, you could do shock and vibration tests. Um, those are the things that you use to evaluate, because if your shipping container can withstand that and undergo the duration of time and still hold temperature, there really shouldn't be a difference um, in, in how you're treating that as long as your product is safe. Great, um, I have another question. I have read about your Sense Anywhere monitoring system. Do you or your customers use these for validation or just for day-to-day -day monitoring between qualification? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, uh, we do. We use those. Uh, we use those all the time. Uh, we use them for box trucks, vans, uh, our own fleet. We've used it to, to be able to map them out. So not only do we use them for for monitoring, but we do use them for for validation work as well. Uh, they also could be used for shipment as well. They have uh, they have GPS. They have a lot of uh, uh, pretty interesting and, and pretty cool options that, that come along with them. Um, you know, long battery life. They could be reused. They're not going to be thrown out. Uh, and as we think Tuan mentioned earlier uh, in this presentation, you know, you get the real life data, so you got it uh, right then and there. Um, we do have uh, these access ports that go along with them. So you can get your data when you're on the road too, if you want to. You can even have the GPS track exactly where it's going. So it's 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 a uh, pretty interesting, but yeah, it's it's used just besides besides the monitoring. It can be used for validation as well, and we, and we do use them. Okay. I'm just to add on um, too. Um, okay. Go ahead. Do you, do you have something else? Rob, that, uh, I, yeah, you can even use that on your mobile phone. So from from basically anywhere, you can check the data, you can check the grass, and you can see how your your uh, basically your studies are running so it's really really convenient to use great um the next question i have is about cryo transporter pre-charging it seems like eight hours is fairly standard for pre-charging why was this duration chosen and when would you go with something different uh johnny i'm gonna give this one to you you were talking about about that stuff just a few minutes ago so it's coming over buddy yeah so uh, you know the preconditioning uh you, somebody's done these studies at, at the manufacturer level uh to to determine what level of pre-charge is sufficient so a liquid nitrogen storage vessel for example or a shipping vessel uh you actually charge it by dumping liquid nitrogen inside of an empty vessel and you let it sit for a duration of time so that the the ln2 could soak and and actually soak into like a honeycomb type of material and and you know the the quit the charge procedures they have or the preconditioning procedures um because ln2 it dissipates over time so you would need to uh come back several hours later and fill it and top it off i guess let it sit for a duration of time then you dump everything out and you can use it it's it's acclimated it's at temperature there there seems to be and and from what i've seen two main methods and one is an overnight uh, charge and one is a quick charge. Al Alex has actually done a lot with this. Um, Alex, can you maybe talk a little bit about the differences between the two? Yeah, sure. So basically, your overnight refill is your most conservative way, right? So you fill it up overnight, you give that L2 a lot of time to wick up into your honeycomb material, right? Uh, till it is saturated. So you give that overnight and then you do another refill maybe eight hours, maybe four hours before you actually go and ship it out. Um, and that can that basically guarantees that your the material that the LN2 wicks up into is saturated with LN2 and is uh, ready to go. So 
honestly, any uh, any as long as you fill it up a couple times, to, that's the most conservative way. You're gonna have the maximum of Allen two in there. Thank you. Great. Um, I have another question about transport qualification. When selecting a route for transport qualification, do you choose the most likely route, the worst case scenario, or both? Alex, do you mind taking that one? Sure. So um, it, it really depends on what, what study you want to you're running and what you want to accomplish. So you want to definitely test your worst case route when you're um, when you're doing your performance qualification of a new unit. If you're doing a, and you also want to do your most likely route. Uh, but if you're just doing a recall recall of this uh, shipping container, uh, the most likely route you're going to travel on is the uh, the way you want to do things. Um, you already have that data from your worst case um, scenarios when you qualified it originally. So if you're recalling, um, it is definitely okay to just do the uh, most likely route. Yeah. Can I add to that too, um, Alex? So, so um, I think sometimes we can very easily go down the rabbit hole of the what if scenario. You know, well, what if it sits on a dock for three days? And what if, you know, something happens and the truck breaks down? And I, I think when you're looking to Alex's point, when you're looking at either your uh, most frequent route or your, uh, your, your worst case, um, I would base that off of normal operation, you know, because you, when you get into a scenario where you're saying, well, worst case route, and if now you got to take a detour and nobody's there to answer the door and it sits overnight, you'd be doing your study for <laughs> weeks. Um, so I think the key words, and it's very defendable, uh, choose your route, whatever that may be, the worst case or frequent route, but I would base it off a of normal operation uh, because now you're looking at something that's repeatable. Okay. Um, I have a question. Do you have any tips for choosing the best guidance? ISPE, who, or ISTA? Yeah, let me uh, let me think about this one. Um, for so so for best guidance, uh, depending on on what you're looking to have mapped, um, I would say all those guidances are, are good out there. There's there's even more too that's out there than than just that. But I'd say choose the best application that's going to give you the, the, the best uh, sensor placement for for what you're looking to have mapped the most comfortability uh, so when you're when you're going into it um, take a look at all that stuff now if you're if you're already tied into it because it's part of your validation plan that's that's what you have to do but uh, certainly there's a lot of different guidance that's out there and there's uh, a lot of them tend to touch on the same type of things but you might have different sets of counts depending on what you're what you're looking to do but uh but yeah there's uh, uh the way to do it is to research it figure out which is going to work for you what is going to give you the best mapping for your for your product and then go forward with that do you guys have anything else on that one um i, I like personally i like to my, my first go-to usually when looking at these sometimes you have a hybrid um, take for instance a truck. It's it's to Alex said earlier. It's like a cold chamber on wheels, and it's like a shipping container. But it's also like a warehouse because now you look at the seasonal extremes. Um, you know, I, I I like to go to USP uh, 36 1079 uh, because it talks about facilities, it talks about vehicles, and it's very high level guidance, and it's a good guidance. And um, for shipping containers, you get a little bit more into the detail in ISTA 7E2010, um, because now it talks about um, with the shipping container, you can actually simulate uh, thermal profiles. So those, uh, I think, are good ones to start with. Uh, to Rob's point, there's a lot of other great guidance out there, but uh, th those to me, I think uh, I've used them, I I've used them often, you know. Okay. I have one last question I think we have time for. It's, um, I'm familiar with the standard DICE model for relatively square warehouses. What modifications, if any, do I need to make when mapping a refrigerated truck? There's your warehouse card, Johnny. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Swan, you want to take this one? Yeah, I can take this one. Thank you. Um, so, the standard DICE model works with almost any control temperature mapping since when you look at a, a DICE model, 
you're basically mapping the whole storage envelope of where you're going to store your material. So in terms of modifications, it's very minor. When you're looking at a trailer truck and how large it is, um, some things to look at is if you're running a static or you're running a dynamic uh, type of qualification um, and you're dealing with extreme heat or extreme coldness, you want to see where uh, the extreme uh, heat or the, where the direct sunlight is hitting. And then maybe you want to put a, a sensor in that area. Um, other things you may want to look at is if you're dealing with uh, a truck that has a controlled, uh, controlled temperature or set point or controller in it, you want to make sure that your controller is working properly. So maybe you want to put a sensor adjacent to the controller to verify that, you know, that probe is reading correctly and your 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 trailer or your truck is um, uniformly in your operating range. Uh, another thing to look at, uh, something that we elaborate a lot on, is having an outside sensor. So what the outside sensor does is if you're in extreme hot or extreme cold weather, that will tell you the trends on what the shift looks like on your sensors when it's the hottest part of the day or the coldest part of the day. So that'll determine, um, that'll determine your hot spots based on the conditions of the day. So those are a couple of things that uh, you may need to modify based on the DICE model, but usually typically the DICE model works for a lot of different control temperature mappings. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions I have, and um, we're almost out of time. So I think this has been great. Thank you to all of our panelists and to all of you for attending. Hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned some things today. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us anytime, any of our panelists or on our website at mossy.com. And um, uh, just a reminder that the recording will be sent to you within 24 hours um after this presentation so thanks have a great afternoon everyone thank you all thank, thank you. you everyone thank you thank you